Wow. I'm Cal. I am an editorial cartoonist, and I am an extremist. Okay? But, but, look, I gotta make it clear from the beginning. I'm not one of those, like, you know, crazy fundamentalist, radical bomb thrower kind of guys, you know? No, what I mean is, as an editorial cartoonist, I live in a world of four extremes. And today I want to tell you guys a little bit about my world of extremes and how my world may be extremely telling about your world. Okay, so first I want to join an old friend of mine, the blank piece of paper, to tell you about the first world of extremes that I live in, and that is the world of the black line, okay? Black line, black and white. I live in a black and white world, while the rest of the world, your world, is a world full of color. And it's a very complicated and complex world. Your world has got millions of people with millions of ideas and opinions, and people are yelling and screaming at each other and competing for, for, for attention. But in my world, my job is to make your world and distill it down to a few simple black lines that everybody can see and understand in very quick succession. Thank you. So, to help further explain my world of simple lines, I wanted to share with you a very important cartoon in my career, one of my seminal cartoons. It's one of my early works. So, <laughs> so this cartoon, yeah, this cartoon I did when I was six years old, and it stars Abraham Lincoln, Gettysburg Address, and the reason why this is such an important cartoon, because this cartoon inspired a feature-length motion picture starring Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> you know it. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, so anyways, here's the thing about this cartoon that's important, is at this time, at age six, you and I are the same. Because at age six, we are all drawing, aren't we? Everyone here is drawing. We're using crayons and pencils, trying to make sense of the world of, of grown-ups. But this instinct to draw, I think, is inside all of us. I think it's etched in our DNA. You can see it in the prehistoric uh, you know, cave drawings, and you can see it in the tombs of ancient Egyptian pharaohs, all the lines that are etched in there. But somewhere along that line, you and I diverged. Okay, you decided to leave this line, enjoy the fancy, colorful world of grown-ups, right? I remained a six-year-old, drawing people in lines. And this, by the way, brings me now to the second world of a stream that I'm involved in, and that is the world of caricature, okay? And this is taking faces to the extreme. Now, for an editorial cartoonist, caricature can be a very effective tool. But I also think that a good caricature can be a potent weapon. In fact, I think caricature can be one of the most powerful weapons at the disposal of an editorial cartoonist. Okay? Now, to further explain this, I want for a moment now just to talk about you guys for a second, okay? Not about me. I'm not going to talk about you guys. In fact, I'm going to talk about your face. I want each of you to think about your face for a moment, okay? It's your most prized possession, am I right? It's like one of the keys to your identity. Now imagine a wicked caricaturist focus their aim on your features, and not just the good ones, okay? They take those features, they pull them apart, and then they reassemble it under their whim, okay? Then that unflattering portrait is then put into a newspaper for millions of people to read, okay? And they, so they can ogle and giggle at your expense, right? So it doesn't feel very good, does it? All right, now that's what it feels like to be a politician being lampooned by a six-year-old like me, okay? <laughs> now, it's understandable that you might feel that this is a little bit unfair, after all, you know, being humiliated in front of the public because you're just some private citizen, but suppose you're a public figure, and a public figure prone to making mistakes, like Joe Biden, okay? <laughs> or a neighbor, a friend of yours, um, Dick Cheney, Okay? Right? So, 
In these cases, a good caricature can really come in handy. In fact, I say one of the best ways to puncture the pomposity of the powerful <laughs> is through a pointed, poisonous portrait. And that's what a good caricature is. But now, think about caricature. It's not always about humiliation and distortion. In fact, my favorite quotation about caricature comes from an Italian Renaissance painter named Annabel Caracci. And he said, a good caricature is more true to life than reality itself. And the idea is that if you do a good caricature that gets to the soul of someone, gets into their inner turmoil, it can be more revealing and more memorable those, than those kind of clownish portraits you know, that they do with big ears and funny noses. Now, speaking of clowns, that brings me to the third world of extremes I'm involved in, and that is the world of politics, okay? Crazy world of politics. Now, as an editorial cartoonist, my job is to make sense of all the political mayhem in all the capitals from around the world. And in order to do that, I have to wear many hats. I have to first wear the hat of a journalist, where I'm reporting and researching the important news of the day. But I have to tell you, as a cartoonist, that's a big deal, because we have, amongst all journalists, the largest portfolio to cover. Because I have to draw work that covers local news, state news, national news, and international news. And on top of that, we're having to cover very sensitive subjects like religion, religion. In fact, here, let me show you this cartoon I did a few years back about religion, okay? Here is in heaven, on the phone, hello, Lord Almighty's office, Michael the Archangel speaking, may I help you? Voice from off stage, who is it? It's Pope John Paul II on the line. Again? He's worried about this movement to ordain women as priests. But I've already told him what I think. Tell him I'm busy. I'm sorry, she's busy right now. <laughs> right, it's, you know, so we have to carry on this, this tough stuff. But I have to tell you, actually, keeping track of all the news around the world is a big challenge. You know, I can't keep track of what my own kids are doing, nonetheless what's going on in Tajikistan. But now, fortunately, though, for us cartoonists, the politicians around the world are the best script writers you could ever ask for. Right? They supply us with a whole mountain of material from which we can draw inspiration. Now, here's an example. This is a cartoon I did back in 1999. I just come back from Cuba, where, among things, I met with a whole group of Cuban cartoonists. So here's Uncle Sam. He's saying, people of Cuba, why stick with that dictator idiot Castro when you can freely elect your idiots like we do? <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. You can be a dictator or a Democrat. You can still supply enough news and, and, and good material for cartoonists. But here's the thing. We cartoonists don't just cover fun and games. We also have to cover very serious things. War. Their everlasting turmoil in the Middle East, this blame game. And there's another blame game here in the United States, the conflict over, over high-powered weaponry in the country. And then we also have terrorism here and abroad. Now, speaking of war, I have to tell you, I'm very proud that I'm a veteran, a veteran of eight, count them, eight presidential campaigns. <laughs> really a lot of hard work. So anyways, we are journalists, cartoonists are journalists, but I tell you what, we don't just cover the news, we comment on the news. We are columnists. We use our journalistic knowledge to give you informed opinions. And we use our informed opinions, <laughs> we use humor in our opinions, we are addition, we're satirists. <laughs> and in 2008, our job was, was hot in, in, in hot evidence. So this is what happened. I think between Jon Stewart and The Daily Show, right, Saturday Night Live, and the cartoonists around the country, we had a lot to do about framing Sarah Palin, and I think it had a big impact on the result of the election. But you know what, I have to tell you, not everybody agrees with me, 
In fact, I, I, if it's all right with you, I've asked John McCain to come here tonight to rebut that remark. And so I've asked, and I asked him this question, Senator McCain, do you really think that Sarah Palin is qualified to be president of the United States? Listen, my friends, Sarah Palin is qualified to be president. She has ridden caribou to hunt polar bears with bazookas. She has caught Chinook salmon blindfolded with her teeth. No community organizer in Chicago has ever done that, right? Give it up for Senator McCain. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you very much. It's great for you to be here tonight. So, so now, we've already talked, you know, <laughs> cartoonists, you know, we're journalists. We wear these hats, journalist, columnist, satirist. But I tell you what, we also are, we're artists, right? We have to use all the skills of an artist to deliver our satiric commentaries. We use design, composition, and even calligraphy. So altogether, you know, we've covered, what, three out of the four. I mean, we've got um, lines, extreme world. We've got caricature, extreme. Politics, extreme. But now, there is one more. Back in 1988, before I left the UK to come back to work here in the United States, a Lebanese cartoonist by the name of Naj al-Ali was assassinated on the streets of London because of his trenchant cartoons about the Middle East. More recently, I have acted as a president for an international human rights group called Cartoonist Rights Network, which covered the plight of cartoonists around the world. It may surprise you that you know, being a cartoonist is a dangerous job. I'm telling you, there are places today where cartoonists are arrested, tortured, and murdered because of the cartoons. And we forget that over half the world, we could not even have this meeting. Right? The police would march in, you guys would be arrested, I'd disappear not to be seen again. And our crime? Laughing at our own head of state. Now earlier I asked you to contemplate what it would be like for you to have your caricature plastered on a newspaper, millions of people uh, heckling you. Well, you can imagine in a less tolerant society, anybody with their hands on the levers of power will make sure that won't happen to them. That's because cartoons really are on the front line of freedom of expression. This ability to mock and lampoon your own head of state is a real sign of a maturity of a society. And really, actually, in the history of mankind, this ability to practice as a cartoonist has lasted for a virtual nanosecond. So with that, I want to reach to the fourth extreme. And for that, I also would like to draw to a conclusion. Okay? So, as it takes a very mature society to endure the power of caricature and satire, and as it is that we can do this in a place and not worry about the concerns of what would happen to all of us, and that it takes, of course, a very intelligent audience to be able to appreciate all this stuff, I would like to say that I'm extremely lucky to be an editorial cartoonist. And I'm extremely pleased that I can share my world with you. Thank you.